Uh, all right, everyone. It looks like 11.35 by my watch, and we've got a pretty good uh, viewing audience so, so far. Uh, so we'll get started. Uh, my name is Colin Barrows so with the Friends of the Desert Mountains, and uh, we're here today to talk about the hidden desert. Um, and the, the presentation will take about 30 to 40 minutes, and uh, then we'll open up uh, for questions and discussion at the end and uh, unmute people so they can uh, talk if they would like and say hello. Um, so, the uh, description for the talk about the hidden desert, talk about two deserts, and I'd like to, to start the talk today, or the presentation today, by talking about the two deserts. Hopefully we're working here. And pretty much in all my presentations, I try to include this uh, satellite view of the Coachella Valley, or the desert of Southern California. Because you can really see kind of the story, pretty much all the stories that you want to talk about, all the, the things that you want to explain in Southern California come back to the land itself. And this, this slide really shows you um, the, the character of the land um, sort of at a broad scale. And basically what you're seeing is this uh, greenish you know, mountains, a lot of gray concrete out on the west in Los Angeles and down in San Diego and Riverside. And then in the desert, we have a lot of agricultural area and then this huge variety of landscapes, um, this cornucopia beige. Elizabeth uh, likes to repeat my one off, one -off saying on that. Um, and you'd be forgiven for looking at this map and thinking that there's uh, on the, on the left-hand side of your screen, there's a lot of life and the um, right hand side of the screen, there's nothing living there because it's all brown and, and red and white and gray. Uh, and it doesn't look like what a lot of people traditionally associate with life. That's what kind of the idea behind the two deserts. And the, the idea was put forward by Randall Henderson, which uh, in, was the original editor of the Desert Magazine and a really forward thinking guy who wanted to really protect the desert back before World War II. And um, I'm just gonna read his quote because I think it's really powerful about the two deserts. So he said, there are two deserts. One is a grim des desolate wasteland. It is the home of venomous reptiles and stinging insects and of vicious thorn covered plants and trees and of unbearable heat. This is the desert seen by the stranger speeding along the highway, impatient to be out of this damnable country. It is a desert visualized by those children of luxury to whom any environment is unbearable, which does not provide all of the comforts and services of a pampering civilization. It is a concept fostered by fiction writers who dramatize the tragedies of the desert for the profit it will bring them. But the stranger and the uninitiated see only the mask. The other desert, the real desert, is not for the eyes of the superficial, superficial observer or the fearful soul of the cynic. It is a land, the character of which is hidden except to those who come with friendliness and understanding. To these, the desert offers rare gifts, health-giving sunshine, a sky that is studded with diamonds, a breeze that bears no poison, a landscape of pastel colors such as no artist can duplicate, thorn-covered plants, which during countless ages have clung tenaciously to life through heat and drought and wind and the depredations of thirsty animals. And yet each season, send forth blossoms of exquisite coloring as a symbol of courage that has triumph, triumphed over terrifying obstacles. To those who come to the desert with friendliness, it gives friendship. To those who come with courage, it gives new strength of character. Those seeking relaxation find release from the world of man-made troubles. For those seeking beauty, the desert offers nature's rarest artistry. This is the desert that men and women learn to love. So, <laughs> Randall Henderson said that in 1937, if you believe it. And um, if you look at the desert, I mean, it, probably this is a, an audience of people who um, I don't have to make that argument to that the, that there's probably not too many people listening today who think of the desert as a empty place, but I think it bears repeating. So let's look at the same map um, instead populated with, or, or instead of just being empty here, populated with observations of life made on iNaturalist. Um, and you can see that clearly the desert is not empty. Uh, it's full of life. 
Uh, little green dots are plants, blue dots are vertebrates, vertebrate animals, and red dots are invertebrate animals like insects and spiders and scorpions and all kinds of fun stuff like that. And I'm sure you've all been on a hot, uh, walk in the desert or a hike in the desert and seen the kinds of life that we're talking about. So let's quickly, we're gonna go through and see what are the top 10, count down the top 10 things that people see normally when they go for a hike in the desert. Number 10 is the uh, white line sphinx moth. Um, and normally what people see when they see white line sphinx moths are the caterpillars. And you're all probably familiar with, sometimes in the late spring, we get swarms of these uh, giant caterpillars that are about four inches long at the, at the largest. And uh, they'll just come over and devour all of the uh, leftover wildflowers at the end of the wildflower season. Number nine is another kind of swarming insect that people uh, see, which are the um, painted ladies. And we had a big um, migration of painted ladies last year and a pretty good sized one this year too. And they kind of follow the wildflower bloom in the spring. Uh, number eight is the uh, Costa's hummingbird, um, which are not only out in the wild a lot, but a lot of people see them in their backyards. Number seven, I think, is the um, our friendly uh, western honeybee. We then the uh, desert, uh, sorry, desert spiny lizard. This is a nice male with a breeding coloration. Uh, black harvester ants, one of the most common uh, ants, and they're doing really well uh, eat, eating off of the, the seeds and, and leftover plant matter from the annual wildflower bloom. Chuckwallas, some of the, the favorite ve big vegetarian lizards, is a nice female on the Hartsmith Trail. Uh, desert iguanas, the bighorn sheep, and the number one, can anybody guess, the number one animal seen in the Coachella Valley is by far the uh, side blotch lizard. And I think if you look at this picture, you really see the face of a lizard who knows that he's number one. <laughs> uh, so here's the list again. And the uh, bars here are um, arranged in order of, uh, or the bars are a relative, the size of the bars are relative to the number of observations that people have made on iNaturalist. So you can see the common side blotch lizard really just takes it away. but. There's still a, a, a lot of um, life that people are seeing out on the trail. Now, you know, this is a, a concept that Randall Henderson was familiar with back in 1937, but you know, in uh, 2020, things have, technology has progressed. And I think even um, he might've been surprised by not only those, those common species that we see when we're out during the day, uh, and when, when you're out on the trail yourself, you know, you're having an effect on the environment by being there. Uh, but when people leave, there's this whole other desert. It's not just two deserts, there's like a third desert. There's four or five, there's many deserts, depending on uh, the places that you look and the times that you look. So uh, using remote sensing, remote sensing, or in this case, uh, these trail cameras, like this one here, uh, people are able to not only discover that those 10 species that we saw, the real common ones that you see when you're on the trail, but also many others um, that we might not have any chance of seeing without the aid of this kind of remote sensing technology. So uh, Friends of the Desert Mountains has been working on this project since uh, about 20, April, 2017, I think was our first cameras that we put out. And we basically have two different groups of cameras. There's about 15 cameras in total, um, and they're spread out over pretty much over the Santa Rosa and San Jacinto Mountains National Monument. And there's two groups, as I said. So one group is on the Randall Henderson Trail, and this is a picture taken from the Randall Henderson Trail. And you can see uh, pretty much within this picture, you can see all four or five cameras, or if you had you know binoculars and the eagle eye vision, you could see all of the four or five cameras that we have placed on the trail right now. Um, mostly down in the washes. And the reason that we have the cameras out there, particularly on the right Henderson Trail, is that we're interested in finding observations of desert tortoises. And desert tortoises are, are an endangered reptile that's uh, native to the desert of Southern California and ranges up in Nevada and over into Arizona. And we're kind of at the edge of their range here. So you're, you're not likely to see them in most of the places that you go in uh, the Coachella Valley, but 
And the Randall Henderson Trail is one of those places where they are relatively common. And so we have this array of cameras out there monitoring their uh, population. And this is kind of what a camera um, placement looks like. So the, there's a potential tortoise burrow here, a little cave, and you can just see the tortoise. I don't know if people can see my cursor, but you can see the camera here that's pointed at the burrow behind these little three rocks uh, on the center of the screen. Now we have another set of cameras out there that's um, doing water source monitoring. And these are places where you're not gonna see desert tortoises, but you might see other kinds of life. And so this is a place where one of our cameras is placed. It's actually behind this oasis here. Um, here's another camera placement, another oasis. You can see that this oasis is um, feeling some or showing some negative effects from invasive species. There are some invasive tamarisk in the front of the image here and some fountain grass over here on the right. And you can actually see the camera in the image. It's wrapped around the base of this uh, dead palm tree. Pointed at the uh, seat, there's a water source right here. Uh, we have some higher elevation or middle elevation uh, cameras as well. This is a camera you can see on the strap to the side of the uh, pine tree, uh, pinion pine tree in uh, Potrero Canyon. Uh, again, looking at a water source here, a little bit of stream crossing down the middle of the canyon. And there's another camera. We're looking towards the camera uh, now back in the middle of the image in Potrero Canyon. This is actually in Palm Canyon. So this is the Palm, Canyon's, Palm Canyon stream, which is a, a wild scenic river that uh, empties into the Indian canyons and then into the Whitewater Canal or the Whitewater River. And uh, we have one camera on a man-made guzzler or a, a place where water is provided to wildlife. Uh, and you can see the camera here uh, strapped to a planted tree and it looks at the uh, concrete water source here. And those cameras are mostly interested in the population or looking at uh, bighorn sheep. But as we'll see as we go further, there's um, many other species that they pick up. This is kind of what a camera placement looks like on those water sources. Try to find places, you know, whenever possible, um, find something to block them to so they don't get taken away. We have had one camera. We have, I believe, 15 total cameras that have been placed. Uh, something like 30 or 40 times uh, over the last three or four years. And uh, I've only lost one camera over that time, but partly because we try to lock them to things if we can. Sometimes you have to get creative and find some rocks or things like that to lock them to this is another camera placement. So what kind of results, just in sort of raw um, data, what kind of results are we getting? Since uh, April, 2017, we've collected over 200,000 images. Uh, the bulk of those, almost uh, over 133,000 are on the uh, Randall Henderson Trail and looking at the tortoise burrows, uh, about 80,000 looking at water sources, and then a smaller number um, that were sort of testing out the cameras at the visitor center, the Santa Rosa and San Jacinto Islands National Monument Visitor Center, and at the Nightingale Cabin, which is a historic site that uh, friends helped manage in the Santa Rosa Mountains. And so just to kind of give you an idea of um, what that data looks like when you, when you put your memory card back in, this is a camera placement. You can see the bighorn sheep just kind of wandering around in front of the camera. So there's about 250 images here that have been stitched together into a little time lapse. And I'll play it one more time. You can see how you can get to um, 80,000 images or 200,000 images even pretty quickly. Uh, this was about an hour and a half worth of time of uh, bighorn sheep just hanging out in front of the camera. There's a water source right below the level of the uh, screen. Uh, so if you look at sort of the different projects and sort of the success rate of what the cameras are getting, what we're seeing is about, uh, for the tortoise patrol, about 50% of the images that we see contain an actual animal and uh, about 50%, a little more than 50% um, have nothing in them or have um, like a, tail or something like that that was unidentifiable. So that's uh, it's a lot of work to go through all that data. And if you look at the water sources, it's uh, you might even say a little worse, I guess, or um, we're getting few more images with nothing in them or things that are unidentifiable in them. Um, 
but still lots of animal images and um, when it comes to the water sources, a fair number of people who uh, cross in front of the cameras. And uh, just to think about why we're getting so many of those um, uh, images, images that don't have anything here, uh, I have an example from uh, a camera that we have. This is about 2,000 images stitched together. I bet you can probably guess the date of this um, time lapse. This is from February 14th, 2019, that giant storm that we had. And that's about 12 hours of <laughs> uh, flash flood going in front of the camera, uh, starting at about five in the afternoon one day and then going until five in the morning of the following day. And you can just see the incredible amount of water that came through the the canyon there. But luckily we do get lots of life. In fact, we've seen uh, at least 52 species uh, walk in front of the camera, 52 identifiable species walk in front of the cameras at some point over the last uh, three years, four years. And this is a tree of life a diagram that kind of shows how the groups of animals that we're seeing. So uh, you can see sort of going clockwise, starting with the Eurybunus here, that's uh, Harvestmen or daddy long legs, kind of uh, close to a spider, uh, tarantulas, other insects and invertebrates, and then um, a few uh, frogs and toads, and a pretty good variety of mammals. And then over here on the left, we're looking at rodents and uh, rabbits and squirrels and those kinds of things. And then larger step over here, uh, reptiles, a pretty good group, a variety of reptiles, including snakes and lizards. Uh, desert tortoises, and then uh, a good variety of birds as well. So let's go through, separating the two projects, let's go through what sort of what the main species that we're seeing. And here they are, or again, arranged the same as the other graph. And as you can see, the number one thing we get is antelope ground squirrels. We get lots and lots and lots of pictures of antelope ground squirrels. They just go back and forth in front of the camera all day long and uh, set it off. So, we're, we're getting lots of those, but we do get lots of desert tortoises. These are you know, thousands of images of desert tortoises um, and uh, a fair number, a good variety of other birds and reptiles. So there, here's our antelope ground squirrels. Again, going just going back and forth the camera all day long. Desert tortoises, of course. So we're getting some, we're getting the data we want, which is good. Uh, pack rats, this is a pack rat carrying uh, nest building, I guess, or carrying a, a cactus um, a branch in its mouth to help uh, build up its den. Chuckwallas. Most of these cameras are set up to, or they're just sort of designed to take pictures of things that are kind of farther away, so they don't really focus very well close up, but most of the animals close to the camera, even though they're a little blurry, are still identifiable. Uh, Black-throated sparrows. Uh, rock wrens. Uh, this is a side blotch lizard that really like leaped in front of the camera for some reason. He was having a good day or bad day, I don't know. Desert spiny lizards, just like that one we saw earlier, big, big male with uh, breeding colors there. Whiptail lizards and uh, pocket mice or pocket a group of uh, small rodents that are, include pocket mice and kangaroo rats that are hard to identify from the blurry um, trail camera footage. And if we look at the water source data, oops, my labels are backwards. Uh, look at the water source data, uh, we're getting lots far and away, lots and lots of bighorn sheep. So we're getting what we want there as well. Um, but also some kind of surprising things and, and some really amazing um, animals uh, that were, or at least to me, when we first started this project were really surprising. So let's look at those. We get the bighorn sheep. Spotted skunk, this is one that really surprised me. I mean, I knew there were spotted skunks here, but the, the number that we got is, um, I've been getting on the cameras is really um, surprising. And part of that has to do with their behavior. So if you think about something like a coyote, when it walks in front of the camera, we see it. Usually the coyote is there to drink some water and then it leaves. But the spotted skunks really kind of hang around in front of the cameras. So you can get uh, a time lapse like this one, which is just one night of spotted skunk um, hanging out in front of the camera. 
and you get about 250 images like this in one night and then it'll come back the same night or the, come back the next night and then the night after and the night after. So it can be one animal that's really bumping up the numbers on those um, on those species counts. But this is, you know, it's just the way that spotted, their behavior is that they like to be near a little bit of water and there's a seep here that it's kind of hanging around and probably eating uh, like insect larvae and things like that that are taking advantage of the moist soil around that uh, seep. Uh, the number three, three species again on the on the water sources was uh, a little bit of a surprise was these uh, black phoebes. And it's a similar behavioral reason that you get so many of them. So here's another time lapse of uh, black phoebe, hopefully. And uh, black phoebes are fly catchers. So their behavior is that they will uh, sit on a rock usually and swoop back and forth and eat the flies that are going around. So you can see this one phoebe can um, really bump up the numbers just by uh, flying back and forth in front of the camera and catching flies all day long as it goes. Okay, then we got to start to get in some really fun stuff. We got a really, to me at least, surprising number of bobcats, coyotes, uh, foxes, gray foxes. You can see there's two foxes actually in this image, one behind the little palm tree. Mule deer at higher elevations or medium uh, elevations. Uh, again, pack rats show up in the top 10 here. There's a pair of pack rats at that same site that the uh, spotted skunk was at. Common ravens and mountain lions, which have really, we went for a long time actually um, without seeing any mountain lions on the camera. And then uh, I guess it's been a, a good couple of years for mountain lions because they've really been um, showing up in front of the cameras a lot. Well, relatively a lot. These are animals that, you know, you hike for your whole lifetime and you'll probably never see out in the desert, but they're there. Here's a graph that kind of shows the um, activity levels of the different animals at different times of day. So yellow means they're active during the day and uh, the blue or purple color means they were active at night. So you can see that things like common ravens or the birds, loggerhead shrikes, and a lot of the reptiles and lizards are very active during the day and not active at all at night. And then when you get around, uh, desert tortoise is actually somewhat active at night. Um, and then coyotes kind of tip over to being more active at night during the day, and mountain lions, mule deer, bobcats, and all these things are more um, nocturnal or, in reality, probably more uh, crepuscular, which means they're active during twilight. And then you get down to pocket mice and spotted skunk, and they're pretty much totally nocturnal. So why do we um, why do we do this? put out these cameras besides getting to see some real uh, cool images. So the first few cameras we put out were uh, just around the visitor center and it was kind of a fun project to see what was happening around our offices. We got a lot of pictures of our um, captive desert tortoise Bowser and uh, a few a free, few interesting things. We have some bobcats that kind of come by the visitor center and um, but all, otherwise a lot of squirrels again, a lot of birds a lot of desert horn lizards or desert uh, spining lizards. And the first thing that we um, sort of went out into the wild to uh, look at these, look at the cameras with was to look at those desert tortoises. So this was the first image on the Randall Henderson Trail that we captured with of a desert tortoise uh, with just one camera and then started putting more and more out there. And if you um, have heard of these tortoises on the Randall Henderson Trail before, you might have heard of them uh, there's sort of a, the conventional wisdom, I guess, is that the tortoises are, are pets that were uh, released on the Randall Edison Trail um, and have sort of taken up residence there. I mean, they're, they seem to be surviving, but they're, the idea was that they're not really truly wild tortoises. They didn't get there of their own, um, on their own per, uh, volition, I guess. And Part of the reason to think that is that there are really not very many tortoises anywhere else in the Santa Rosa Mountains. It's like there's one little pocket of uh, tortoises on the Randall Henderson Trail and a few other on the other side of the mountain on, in the Deep Canyon area. So some researchers, uh, you know, the scientists, we don't want to just say, well, that's the conventional wisdom. So we um, 
accept it, we want to test that and see whether it's true because these are endangered animals and it makes a difference whether they're really wild or whether they're captive animals that were released there. Because if they're really wild, that makes them a very unique population and deserving of extra protection. So we wanted to not just see the camera, see the tortoises on the um, images, but also to be able to understand their habits well enough that we could actually go out and uh, with trained researchers ca uh, capture some tortoises, take genetic samples and uh, compare them to other tortoises, compare the DNA to other tortoises to see whether these are in fact tortoises that you would expect to find in the Santa Rosa Mountains genetically or whether they're tortoises from Nevada or something like that, that genetically from Nevada that were released here. So you can see, um, just looking at the shell patterns here, there's a good variety of tortoises that we're seeing, uh, lots of individuals, and more than one tortoise in some cases. Now that tortoise on the left there, that's a tortoise that came, was in this spot for, um, for many days in a row. And we were able to see that during the cameras and this was exactly what we wanted. So we called up the researchers from the United States Geographic Survey who study these kinds of things and have um, licenses and equipment to study the tortoises and came out and uh, had them come out and we got really lucky and actually were able to go out in the morning and found this tortoise sitting right at the beginning of the opening of the den um, with the researchers and it all worked perfectly. And so they were able to uh, capture her. This is her. You can tell it's a her. I mean, we, besides the fact that we uh, got to have a close up look at her, you can tell it's a her because she has this, um, this horn in the front of her underneath her chin is fairly small compared to the males. Um, and you can see if you ever run into her again, you'll be able to identify her because now she has these two little notches on this front um, left-hand side of her shell. And not only were we able to take a DNA sample of, uh, you know, we released her, she was fine, and put her back out there. But not only were we able to take a DNA sample, take it back to the lab and analyze it, but they also have this really amazing portable um, X-ray uh, rig that they use to X-ray her. And when they did that, this is what they uh, found. So you can see this is that tortoise. And um, you can see her bones on the inside. And these two shapes right here, you can probably guess, are eggs. So not only do we have this population of tortoises on the Wrangell Henderson Trail, but they are reproducing. Um, they are making eggs and making more little baby tortoises. So there's future generation of tortoises um, that can, can live in that area uh, in perpetuity. So this was really cool. This is like exactly what we wanted to find. And we're actually seeing not only are they laying eggs, but the tortoises are, there are baby tortoises that the camera picks up down in the bottom uh, right-hand corner of the screen here. You can see this is a juvenile tortoise that uh, walked in front of the camera. It's blurry, but you can see this little cute little tortoise, probably only about two or uh, maybe two and a half inches long. So that was our original purpose when we um, started putting the cameras out there, but there's also lots of sort of uh, other benefits that have come along with that. So not only are we looking at the tortoises themselves and their sort of population and understanding more about them, but also we're able to see things like uh, the timing of migrations, for example. So these are those um, painted ladies that people have uh, Make, made a lot of observations of in the Coachella Valley. And you can see um, there's like a two of them in this image and they showed up in front of the cameras at the right time. So you can you sort of time these um, seasonal events like the arrival of butterflies or the arrival of sphinx, sphinx moth caterpillars. There's one at the bottom of the screen down here. You can just see his little orange head and uh, the black body. Also see other kinds of behavior. So this is a uh, spotted skunk again, and it's actually in its hand got a tortoise egg that uh, I can tell you from the image here or from the next few images that I saw, I didn't eat the egg and the egg was already, um, it never wasn't viable, I guess, or um, never hatched. So the egg kind of was in that den for a long time. Uh, the skunk didn't eat it this time, but we we're, were able to see that kind of behavior. Here's a gray fox that actually has a uh, 
cup right in its mouth. So you can see these kinds of interactions. This is back several months after that spotted skunk with the tortoise egg. The tortoise egg at some point, something ate the tortoise egg. And then things like the um, antelope ground squirrels would then eat little bits of the shell or, or get maybe minerals from the shell um, for a while afterwards. Also, you see interactions between sim the same species. So we have two gray foxes here in front of a camera, a pair of gray foxes. <laughs> we get lots of pictures of squirrels, sometimes uh, you know, interactions between squirrels. Uh, sometimes some really cool interactions between uh, chuck wallows. These are two, you can see big male chuck wallows and they uh, went at it in, in front of the camera for a while. They're very territorial and they um, were pushing back and forth in front of the camera for a while to see who got to maintain this little patch of wash or who was got to be have this little patch of wash in their territory. A lot of times there's uh, multiple animals on screen, but they not interact at all. So they're just kind of getting along in uh, harmony, I guess, <laughs> kind of like a idealized um, space where the animals are, are living together. So here's a tortoise and an antelope ground squirrel, or an antelope ground squirrel and a black-throated sparrow, or there's actually three animals in this um, image. We have a black-throated sparrow here in the bottom left, a antelope ground squirrel on the bottom right, and way up in the top right corner, there's a chakwala who's looking down on top of everybody peeking at us. This is one of my favorite interactions that the cameras have uh, picked up. So here's the gray fox, and uh, probably recognize the, the camera location. And um, this gray fox and a spotted skunk just kind of went back and forth for a while. There's a spotted skunk up in the corner and they didn't seem to um, have any problem with each other. They just kind of traded off in this area and they were both uh, sniffing around for about uh, 10 minutes or so, just you know, trading off on who got to have the water at the spot, I guess, and or who got to eat the little grubs in the ground um, without uh, ever obviously being um, antagonistic toward each other or having any um, idea that they were or not getting along. We can also use the cameras to monitor the health of populations. So here's a bighorn sheep that walk in front of the cameras. You can see he's not, not probably doing all that well. I mean, he, he looks healthy enough, but he's lost a whole, um, his right horn is totally broken away. And that probably means that even if he's able to survive, he probably won't be able to participate in those um, contests for uh, mating that they, the two males do where they ram the heads together. So he's kind of at a, a Darwinian a dead end, I guess. But fortunately, most of the time, what we see on the cameras are, are positive examples of population health. So uh, examples of uh, babies and, and young animals who are, are doing really well. So we've got a uh, young mule deer here. Here's a little flock of mountain quail. You can see the, the parents and there's all these little tiny babies um, moving across the, the stream side there. Lots of uh, small chuckwallas, baby chuckwallas, especially in the last couple of years when we've gotten a lot of spring uh, annual growth. Here's another antelope ground squirrel and you can see this is a female who is uh, lactating. So she's got babies or is about to have babies. And uh, lots of, fortunately, lots of examples of young uh, bighorn sheep. That's a female on the right-hand side of the screen and three lambs or young, young bighorn sheep on the right or on the left. Another uh, thing that we're looking at with the camera data is negative interactions between people and or uh, things that come along with people sometimes and uh, wildlife. So. Unfortunately, we do see some uh, dogs, which are, are not allowed, a fair number of people, and also dogs, which are, are not allowed in these areas, specifically to protect the bighorn sheep. This is not a coyote, because he's got a blue collar. 
and another example of a dog here. And sometimes you get some weird, um, weird animals brought in by people as well, especially at the higher elevations where there are still a few cattle allotments left and some grazing that still goes on up there. Maybe, um, so all those are important uses, but also I think, you know, one of the main uses, one of the main, main important uses for these cameras is really just to, to inspire us. There's really such an amazing um, wild a variety and diversity of wildlife like bobcats and scorpions all around us in the desert. And we get to experience a lot of it when we go out on hikes or in our backyards even, or just a walk around the neighborhood. But a lot of it is um, hidden from us. So things like these uh, red, red racer or coach whip snake, uh, road runners, of course, we're all familiar with, tarantulas, gray foxes again, raccoons even, chuckwallas. This is the one image we ever captured of a ringtail, which are like a sort of like a mongoose that are uh, found around in our mountains. Bighorn sheep, of course, mule deer, desert tortoises, coyotes again, and uh, the ones that really still to get me every time I get one on the camera, uh, mountain lions. Actually, this is a, a fun image. I like to, um, everybody gets focused on the mountain lion, but the, the really important animal in this image is the granite spiny lizard over here that the mountain lion is sort of thinking it might eat, but the, the lizard got away. But lizards are the most animal, important animals we all know. So um, coming down to the, the end of the presentation here, there, uh, I, I sort of misrepresented uh, one of those earlier graphs when we were looking at um, the amount of uh, data that we're gathering out there on the trail. We are kept getting a lot of animals and a lot of uh, people and a lot of um, uh, nothing, <laughs> but uh, the vast majority of the pictures that we've gathered so far, most of those 230,000 images we've gathered so far have not even been looked at at all. This is 60, the purple um, slice of the pie here is images that nobody has had any chance to look at because who has the time, you know, there's no, um, who has the time to go through all that on an individual basis. So um, after this presentation, I'll be sending out a link that actually where you can help and, and look at some of those images and categorize them and make us help discover some of the, the hidden wildlife, the hidden desert that uh, is all around us, but we are not able to see without these cameras. So I'll, again, I'll follow up uh, after the presentation with an email with some links to a, a service called Zooniverse that um, people use to, as a, as a community science platform that you can use to look at these images and you can say if it has a coyote in it or a antelope ground squirrel or mountain lion or a desert tortoise or a uh, palm frond that waved back and forth in front of the camera like this for four hours and took 2,000 pictures of itself. Um, so in closing, I'd like to thank uh, a few people or a few organizations and a few people. First of all, uh, funding for the cameras and some of the cameras themselves were provided both by the Bureau of Land Management uh, and by the Coachella Valley Conservation Commission. So they deserve a lot of credit for, for letting us do this kind of work. Um, I wanna thank uh, Danny Ortiz with the Bureau of Land Management who really um, started the Desert Tortoise Patrol Program uh, many years ago as, or not many years ago, but years ago before we even started putting cameras out there as a volunteer project. Um, I'd like to say there's a lot of volunteers who have helped so far in going out to uh, uh, maintain these cameras. You know, a lot of times you have to hike for miles and miles to change the batteries and change the memory cards on these cameras or uh, for some of the cameras that get a lot of use to really go out and uh, visit them almost once a week because they, they can fill up really quickly. And chief among those volunteers, uh, there's probably two or three volunteers who deserve the most credit. Um, those would be uh, Gail Furby and Tracy Bartlett, and especially uh, Cindy Kramer, who 
really kind of helped restart the tortoise patrol program and, and pushed us into uh, putting a lot more cameras and gathering a lot more data than we had been in the past or that I've been gathering in the past at least. So uh, thank you to all those people who have helped. Uh, here's my contact info if you have any um, uh, questions or if you have questions now, you're welcome to ask. Let me see if I can pull up the pull up the uh, chat here. Uh, and we'll uh, answer some questions. So I see there's people who have been asking questions and feel free to type them in um, as we go. So let's see. So Nancy Fox uh, asked me why, or asks why I said that the lizard is the most important animal. And that's uh, that's kind of a joke, Nancy. I mean, they are the most important animal, but they're maybe not everybody agrees with me on that. So it's subjective uh, uh, <laughs> judgment on my part. I just like lizards the best, I guess. Um, Deborah Chapman says she was surprised that lizards were not included on the list, or snakes were not included on the list, excuse me. We have seen a few snakes. So we, we see uh, red racers occasionally, and we've seen one, um, a speckled rattlesnake on the, the Randall Henderson Trail. And I think a lot of that has to do with the way that snakes move. They're just not very good at setting off the motion sensor on these cameras. So, you know, if you think about a snake uh, moving, it's sort of like stays kind of in a straight line as it moves or in a, in a static path as it moves. And so that there's just not, it's not the kind of movement that really sets off um, the cameras very well because they're really tuned in to movement across the screen. Uh, so it's, it's very possible that many more snakes are going in front of the cameras that we're not seeing just because they don't set off the, the motion segment, uh, sensor. Uh, Kevin asks if the cameras have motion sensors or are they always on? Yeah, so kind of just to follow up on that. Yes, they have a, a motion sensor and an infrared uh, LED light. So that's why they're able to take pictures at night at, um, at night. So they have a motion sensor, anything moves in front of the um, camera, they will set off the motion sensor. And if it's at night, the LED, the infrared LEDs will go off. Um, and uh, he asks if there's a, an AI program to sort the photos. Yes, there are. Um, the ones that I'm aware of all require like programming, uh, advanced programming abilities. They're not like user friendly uh, uh, tools yet. Um, so it's a, a potential if someone has uh, some experience with Python, the programming language Python, and wants to help with that, that that's another option to help. But so far, those, those pro tools have been hard to use. Um, Kristen asks about the, what we found with the DNA sample. Um, the, so the sample that they found, uh, that they analyzed, showed that the tortoise, that, at least that one tortoise, was consistent with DNA that you would expect to see in the Santa Rosa Mountains, or at least it wasn't from a population of, like I said, from like Las Vegas or Northern Arizona or someplace, that there's no way for that tortoise to have gotten um, here without somebody putting it there. Uh, additional use, Susan or Sue asks about additional use restrictions on the Randall Henderson Trail. Uh, now that more is known about the desert tortoise. Um, I don't believe so, Sue. So what, what may happen is that it might be, um, for example, one of the things, if you think about the Randall Henderson Trail, uh, there's uh, the trail and it's right next to Highway 74. And um, some of the data that we're gathering on this um, desert tortoise cameras seems to suggest that the tortoises are very concentrated in sort of the way away from Highway 74. And as you get closer to Highway 74, there's no more tortoises. And the tortoises probably aren't avoiding Highway 74, but what that means, unfortunately, is that it's possible that the the territory of the tortoises that are away from, or the tortoises that have territories that are away from Highway 74 are doing well, and the tortoises that 
uh, have territory that overlaps with Highway 74 are getting hit by vehicles. And so the if we are able to show that these are wild tortoises and not released tortoises, that would justify funding for tortoise fencing along the Highway 74 so that tortoises would not be able to cross the highway and they would be um, maybe safer to, to live in that area near the highway. Um, Jennifer asked about whether they were determined to be wild or native. I think it kind of answered that one. Um, question from Marlon about lots of rabbits in my neighborhood. Is that because of the food sources? Are they in the wild as well? Yeah, we do see um, rabbits on the cameras, especially jackrabbits, uh, but also the um, desert cottontails as well. And, um, but they're one of those animals that seems to do well around people, like things like coyotes and hummingbirds and uh, roadrunners. These are species that seem to have really uh, thrived in our backyards and neighborhoods, and maybe are even more of them um, in the Coachella Valley than there would be otherwise if there weren't golf courses and backyard uh, plants and green lawns everywhere. Ravens would be another example of um, an animal that would be here normally, but probably we have a lot more of them because of the affected people. Um, Donna asks if tortoises that were once pets and were released around the center able to mate with the local tortoises. Uh, yes, they would be if they were pets and released from the tortoises, they're, all, they're still all one species and they should be able to mate with each other um, unless somebody released something exotic like a, one of those giant sulcata tortoises, but we haven't seen any evidence of that. They're all, they're all the endangered desert tortoise. Uh, JV talks about using the public to sift through info and he'd be happy to help. So again, I, I know my the contact info just kind of flashed by there, but we I will uh, send out an email that'll make it easier for you to uh, contact me afterwards with opportunities to just sift through the data. Uh, John Phelps asked if there's a chance you might have seen a river otter along the Coachella Canal on Monroe. Uh, Street and he got a glimpse of a smallish dark brown or black mammal with a tail shaped like an otter. It scampered off into a bush right by the concrete embankment. Anything's possible. I mean, I guess if somebody had released an animal out there, my uh, strong suspicion is that it probably was something like a muskrat or uh, something like that. Or even, um, you know, the Coachella Canal is Colorado River water. So anything that lives along the Colorado River could have followed the canal all the way out if it wanted to. So that include, could include things like muskrats or even a, a beaver or something like that, maybe, but uh, a river otter would be pretty surprising. There aren't any in the Colorado River natively. Um, David asks if there's sufficient data over time to show whether the health of the bighorn sheep and other species is strengthening or weakening. It's a tricky uh, question, I think, because we do get lots of um, observations of bighorn sheep. And it does seem to be, um, you can get a lot, you know, you can go for a month and get a thousand bighorn sheep observations and you can go for another month and get no bighorn sheep observations. And it's probably not because there's something wrong with the, or the bighorn sheep population um, in particular. It's just because maybe it rained and there's a new water source, a, a natural water source uh, up canyon from the, the guzzler water that they're no, they're no, no longer need to visit that, that site potentially. Or um, maybe they're just, you know, walking around the backside of the camera and dripping all the water back there. So, so all of it has to do with the placement of the cameras and which direction the camera is placing and whether um, someone saw the camera and pushed it around so it's facing the back canyon side of the wall instead of where the water is. It's, these are all things that happen or whether I was out there changing the batteries and I didn't push the last battery in all the way and it records no data or I didn't turn the camera on sometimes uh, or you know you get the palm frond that blows back and forth in front of the screen 10,000 times right after you put the memory, new memory card in, fills up, and then you get no new images for the 
the months that the um, cameras are out there. Uh, so it's a, it's a tricky question to answer at the level that we're looking at it, at least. I mean, even, even with 15 cameras and 230,000 images, it's still probably not enough to really draw big conclusions about um, the overall health of uh, big horn sheep populations. But it gives us hints and um, can sort of point us in the right direction of the uh, new research or new questions that we need to ask. Uh, Sue asks if the bikes on the Henderson are a problem for the dead tortoise. Um, it, another question that's kind of hard to answer, but at least my sense is that no, I mean, if you, um, my feeling is if you're on a mountain bike on the Randall Henderson, you're pretty tuned in to what's right in front of you. I mean, it's a, it's a rocky trail, fairly rocky. And um, you'd have to pay close attention to what's right in front of you. And I think the bikes are probably avoiding the tortoises um, are pretty well. At least we haven't, as far as I know, there we haven't heard any reports of negative interactions between bikes and tortoises. Um, Kevin asks if there's nearby wildlife corridors that might be a good place for a camera. Yeah, so all of the places where we have cameras are wildlife corridors. I mean, basically the whole, um, the whole desert is a wildlife corridor. And in the past, we have actually funded specifically like the narrow uh, research into those narrow um, connection points under Highway 10, uh, along Highway 62, and place not just cameras, but also um, use track pads and other, other data gathering methods to look at whether bighorn sheep, for example, were moving between the peninsular population on the south side of I-10 uh, with the desert population on the north side of the I-10. And at least from the research that we looked at, um, this was a few, maybe about seven or eight years ago, maybe a little more. Uh, it doesn't seem like at least bighorn sheep are moving, but many other species are using those corridors underneath I-10 to move back and forth, like um, uh, bobcats and small animals, especially. Uh, Rhonda asks if, there are certain times of day or night when certain species are likely to be seen. Yeah, absolutely, I mean, so that uh, graph early on about, um, it showed the percentages of activity for different animals. So things like lizards and reptiles in general, they're cold blooded, so they really need to be out during the middle of the day and they can't do, except for a few exceptions like geckos, which we haven't seen on the cameras probably because they're too small, um, are active, but the reptiles are mostly active during the day. Most of the birds are active during the day outside of things like owls and uh, nighthawks. And, uh, and then things like, oops, things like the coyotes and bobcats and spotted skunks and raccoons, these are all things that are active at night or in twilight times. Um, Hal asks, how often are the cameras relocated? It depends on the camera. So um, some cameras I will put out there or someone will put out there um, for a month or two and we come back in a month or two and check and see whether the images we're getting are any good. And they're no good. It's just like, it's a bad spot because of there's too much vegetation maybe, blows back and forth in front of the camera and it's just not likely to catch anything. So those cameras might only be out there for a few weeks or a few months. Um, some cameras that have been very successful, we try to leave in those two places. So we have at least one camera that hasn't moved in um, three years. Uh, Sue asks, what is the word again for creatures that are active or twilight? That's one of my favorite words, favorite vocabulary words, and it is crepuscular. Uh, Jane asks, how often do you change the batteries and collect the memory sticks? Oh, she has a few questions here. I'll try to take them one at a time. How often do you change the batteries and collect the memory sticks? Uh, it depends again on the camera. So, and, and where they are and how easy they are to get to and what they're looking at. So a lot of those desert tortoises, um, the ones on the Randall Henderson, they're real easy to get to, especially before we were um, shut down and away from our office. You know, I could go out in the morning once a week or volunteers especially would go out once a week or every other week and check the cameras. But you really don't need to go out that 
um, often, unless you're like with the desert tortoises, you want to know if there's a tortoise that's sort of taken up residence. But um, a lot of the cameras that are further out in the middle of nowhere are um, very hard to get to. It can, you have to hike for hours and hours to get to where they are. Um, some of them are in places that are off limits to the public for nine months out of the year because they're protected bighorn sheep habitat. And so we've had cameras that have gone for more than a year. And you know, you can look on when you go back and download the data, you can see the picture of you or me walking away um, in December. And then when you come back in February of the following year, um, you can still get the image of you walking back up to change the camera and turn it off and, and switch the memory stick. So it really depends on how many images you're getting. Um, and you know, if it it can fill up the memory cards very quickly if it's taking those pump fronds going back and forth like this, or if there's not much activity in front of the camera, it can go for months and months, if not years. Uh, and qu next question is if ATVs ride around off trail, and I've heard they can be very damaging. Um, definitely. So in, in any of the places where we have cameras, they're all in the National Monument. And if there are ATVs out there, they're there illegally. Um, I don't, I can't recall any situations uh, where we had to worry about it um, on the Randall Henderson Trail where the tortoises are. It's, you know, it's pretty well marked when you get to the beginning of the trail that there's no, no uh, ATVs allowed there. But uh, we have seen them in some of the more wilderness areas, we have seen some ATVs out there. And when it happens, you know, if we see something negative happen in front of the camera, then we report that to the, um, to the Bureau of Land Management or the Forest Service or to wh whoever the relevant landowner is. And you may not be able to do anything about it because a lot, a lot of time, you know, if you're looking at images that are months old um, after the fact and you may not be able to identify like the person who was out there or track down the person based on the fact by their look at their dog or whatever. But um, at least they're able to know where the, the negative um, interactions are happening and potentially add additional signage or um, do uh, patrols in that area if they need to. Yeah, but out in the Mojave, especially ATV, um, you know, where it's more sort of uncontrolled, uh, ATVs are a real problem for desert tortoises, both crushing burrows and the small tortoises. And then David asks, if we considered adding a camera to study the Casey's June beetle near Plum Canyon Wash uh, in Oswick Canyon, if small insects can be viewed by the camera. We do see small insects on the camera, but my sense is that they don't, they're not as, you know, sort of like the snakes, they're not as good at setting off the, the camera as uh, larger animals. So I don't think we're seeing really a, a good representative sample of the invertebrates that are out there. And because of the focus issues, they can be very hard to identify. So but telling a Casey's June beetle between a regular June beetle or between even another type of beetle or even something that's not a beetle at all could be pretty tough. Um, but there are other community science efforts looking at Casey's June beetles. So the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service um, goes out and does monitoring on the Casey's June beetles in, a, in another way. So cameras are not really, the, I don't think really the right solution there, but uh, we can say those in other ways. Uh, Hal asks if there's a link to see real-time images. No, we were, we're using um, the cheap cameras that uh, don't have any kind of connection to the internet or anything like that. And most of them are in places where even if we um, could, or if, if we wanted to buy the much more expensive cameras that do that, there's no internet uh, signal. Most of the Randall Henderson doesn't have Wi-Fi or, or not Wi-Fi, uh, cellular service. Um, and the ones that are really out in the wilderness, not in the wilderness areas, but away from a civilization are um, out of uh, cell service. Uh, but uh, we try to post the images or share some of the best images that we see on our Facebook page and on social media and stuff like that. So you can get a look at them, but there's no way to see real-time images so far. Any more questions? All right, I'm gonna, let's see, I'm gonna try and get back to my thing. If any, I'm gonna unmute 
folks. And if they want to um, say hi or ask us any other questions, you're welcome to uh, say hello. Yeah, Colin, it's the Bill Baker, too. Yep. Uh, I've seen spotted skunks down here behind my house on the Citrus Golf Course. Yep. And they're out at night. To clarify that for anyone is there, I was out there when my puppy was new surveying the course for coyotes, and I did see the spotted skunks. My other question or comment is that is that tortoise family on Randall Henderson still between post 10 and I mean 11 and 12 on the uh, Boy Scout signs? Yeah, if, so if you um, are out hiking the Randall Henderson Trail and you're familiar with the trail, the area right around the uh, the bench, the Boy Scout bench that's up there. Yeah, that's 11 and 12. On the loop. That's kind of like the epicenter of where we see tortoises. Um, so it's very, not common, but if you're going to see a tortoise, you're going to see it within probably 500 feet of that spot. Um, and we would see them go up and see, catch them after every rain. Use yeah. yeah, I mean, it's one of those behavioral um, things that tortoises do. Even in the middle of the winter, they may come out after a rain and I'll sort of dig a little trench um, out in front of their burrow to catch water, and then they can drink the water um, from their little uh, their little trench if they need to. Yeah, the, so the skunks are like the most nocturnal of any animal. I've never seen, I've seen a single skunk come out in the middle of the day. They're always out in the middle of the night. I know. Any more questions? Thank you, Colin. It was very interesting. It was wonderful. Really thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Yes. You're welcome. Thanks for all for tuning in. Thank you. And, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Another job well done. We'll see you next week. Really fun. Really fun. Thank you, Colin. You say, oh, there's Cindy, Cindy the, the person we owe this all to. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thanks, Colin. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, hey, everybody. Guys. <laughs> Bye. Awesome. Yeah, that's good knowing. Well done. Colin, I'm going to give you a call if you're available. Sure. Okay, great. Thanks. It was super. Thank you again. See you, everybody.